And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable, episode 83. It's going to be our Mississippi State football preview tonight. If you're just joining us in, uh, this is our third year of doing this football preview. We kind of break down each team and take a look at them and see where we think they're going to end up, what the what their strengths are going to be, what they're what they're lacking, what they're missing. So we're going to try to take care of some of all those issues and and let you give you guys a handle on on the team that you your team's going to be playing this year. So I know if it's your team, you're fully invested in them and you're going to know a lot more than we might on a particular program. So we're going to try to give you some of the some of the things to be looking out for on the programs that your team might be playing this year. So it, it's our third year. Uh, we just finished our Mississippi State preview tonight as well. We're double double stacking these, I guess, is one way to put that. Uh, in the years past, we've done these all as one episode. This year, we're breaking them into two. At least we're trying that tonight. If it doesn't work, next week you might see just one podcast. But we're going to see how it's going. If the technical issues I just have keep going, you, you never know. We might just blow this all up and just not do it at all. Uh, that's that's not an option. We're we're here. We're invested. We're here to do this. That that's just a joke. But had a few technical difficulties on the the in between here, and I got those mapped out. Uh, it's a one man show from the uh, audio side of things on this side, so I apologize for that. But we just finished the uh, University of Florida preview, so that's episode 82. If you're interested in catching those guys out, uh, like I just said earlier, if you're you're not going to hear that on the previous podcast. Is uh, we didn't do costume changes, so players wearing the same outfit, Shane's wearing the same outfit, and uh, we're going to get right into things and take a look at, at us. So if you follow us on YouTube, we're on SECSRT. You can get us anywhere. You can get a podcast, iTunes, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, any uh, audio cast type place has those, as well as our website, SECSRT. They get posted up there as well. So enjoy uh, doing the first podcast with you, Blair. Thanks for coming on and doing this again all over. I'm excited, man. And that's Blair Smiley. So thanks for being on here, Blair. I know you are excited because we're going to do Mississippi State. And that's right. If you're new to this this uh, podcast, you know, we're fans. We're, we all have our loyalties. Uh, we all speak from a fan's perspective, but we try to do that in an educated format. We don't just sit there and, and blindly act like some call-in um, person just blinders on about our programs. We try to have some sort of an open opinion uh, but but bring those insights to you from the fans' perspective so that you can see what, what we're thinking uh, from the full side of the SEC, not just one team. So it's about all the teams on the SEC. I know you're going to probably notice there's a few concentrations out here. We're working on bringing on some more guests from some other, other colleges. So got a few things lined up as we enter into this college football preview uh, season. So let's get right into things. We did cover some of the SEC Media Day program. Uh, if you're just now listening in again, you can catch it anytime you want. But this is being recorded the weekend after media day. So a lot of turmoil, a lot of conversation, a lot of excitement uh, to the unofficial kickoff of college football happened this week. So we're going to talk just a few minutes about that. Uh, we did cover some of that in depth on the previous podcast. So make sure you check that out as well if you're in, interested in that. Um, Clowney stole the show on the East, and you got to say Manziel. Uh, and his issues stole the show on the West. I think that's a uh, that's a good way to put it, Shane Manziel and his uh, his circus uh, event that day. I believe he was I think he was supposed to take the podium at like 8:30, and um, they actually broke in live to national ESPN with a uh, Jessa Tory or just a I can't ever say his name. Um, uh, the one of the ESPN guys that was down there that uh, broke in and asked him a lot of questions about that Manning um, passing camp, you know, fiasco that that it kind of turned into, and um, you know, and it was it was one of those things, Shane. I mean, it's the the kid's 20 years old, and whenever he figures out that he's not like every other 20 year old college student, it's going to make his life a whole lot easier. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where sometimes life isn't fair <laughs> and, uh, it's the figure, the sooner you figure it out, the better it's going to be. Um, you know, Peyton Manning doesn't wake up every day going, you know, whatever I do, uh, fair or not, it's going to be reported. Um, so, um, there's a lot of advantages that come with that. 
um, there's a lot of disadvantages. So um, Johnny Manziel seems to be having a, a fun time of trying to learn that process as a 20-year-old in a social media world um, and, and kind of makes a lot of the a lot of mistakes, but uh, so that that was it. I mean, that was. And, uh, and let's let's rewind that for just a second. Yeah. I don't think he's making a lot of mistakes that other twenty-year-olds are making. He's just making mistakes that twenty-year-olds that are leading a SEC football program are making. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, most of the stuff he's done, I, I'm willing to bet that the majority of college students that that go out and have a good time, and and classes maybe second or third on their priority list are right. doing some of the same type of things that Johnny Manziel's done. Uh, the difference is the age we live in with social media, everybody is a reporter, everybody has a camera, everybody has a video camera. Right. There's nothing that you cannot do that's not going to be uh, being able to be broadcasted within a minute and a half after it's been done. Yeah. And, and see, that's the problem... I'm sorry, yeah. and that's something you didn't have 10 years ago. Right, yeah, and the, and the problem that you have is that, you know, it still comes back to a little bit of the basics. You know, here's a kid that's 20 years old that aspires to go to the NFL, and most people say that he's going to be here another year, that he's going to end up leaving because he's he creates enough controversy with himself that he probably can't do two more years in school. Um, but it's just one of those things, you know, you know, Shane, there's things that we did when we were 20 years old as college students that, you know, uh, did you ever go out and get drunk and, you know, uh, wake up late for a class or something? Yes. Um, late? I just wouldn't go. Right. Or, <laughs> or, you know, if you had this really, really important internship that was going to be possibly something uh, that you could eventually do a career that you kind of have set out to do, do the the day before, you know, you're you're supposed to have some obligations. Do you go get hammered? Um, you know. Now, do you, you want me to answer do this you miss that? I mean, do you miss that? I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's one of those things where here's an opportunity to be at a Manning passing camp, and you know, and and you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. If you take if you take not only Manzel, but I thought it was very interesting to hear AJ McCarron, who you know, the next day basically took the opportunity to say, hey, I know a lot of NFL teams are going to be watching me right now, and I'm fixing to basically say that Johnny Manziel is a buddy of mine, but I understand that I'm the quarterback at Alabama, and with it comes a lot of expectations. And the Manning passing account, A.J. McCarron didn't have a problem going to the bar and having a couple of Cold pops, but he didn't miss all of his obligations while he's there. He didn't get sent home, um, and so you know, Manzel has kind of created a little bit of this for him. Is it kind of innocent stuff? Yes, but is it innocent stuff that you just basically go, oh, I just should be forget about it? Well, if you're an NFL team or you're the college coach, you know, I go look around. Aaron Murray's not doing this, you know. Robert Griffin the third, I never really heard about that stuff. You know what I mean? It's like these are you kind of got to figure out. You got to figure out the road here, and so um, you know, it's just it's just funny because I mean the Heisman Trophy man it cast a long shadow, um, and uh, so he's. Uh, I'm really interested to see how things go for him this year because um, you know he. He, he's probably a little spoiled, and, you know, he's just having a hard time kind of grasping that, you know, everything he does is a big deal. Yeah, and and the difference between McCarron and uh, Manziel is, is their upbringing, too. Yeah. I mean, you know, Manziel is, is afforded a life that most college football players aren't afforded. You know, he comes from you know, yeah. some money, and, and yeah. so he's going to – and what's what's he can sad go to the is Heat's finals game. <laughs> what's that? He can go to the Heat's finals game. Yeah, um, you can do stuff like that. Yeah. But what's what's sad about that is that the perfect opportunity for him to understand his position and his role and his upbringing would to be to have been at the Manning camp. Yeah. yeah. What better quarterbacks? Because they they came from the same type of privilege that 
I mean, they had some of the same things that. And he was a camp. He was a he was a kid at the camp three years ago. I mean, he was one of the camp kids. I mean, it was it was just a bad deal. I mean, he just you know because I mean because Peyton Manning and Eli Manning don't wake up and Archie wake up in the morning and go, hey, let's go send the Heisman Trophy winner home. Like you know. I mean, they, that's not their intentions, you know. Now they're kind of stuck in this awkward deal because, you know, this this kid decided that, yeah, he's going to screw around and not live up to any obligations. And, and the excuse, and first of all, Shane, the excuse about his phone dying, I mean, come on, let's pick a story and get to it. How many 20-year-olds do you know that has their phone die? It's the most important item they have. Well, in their possession. They, they, if they if it's died, it's because they were out all night with it. They they weren't back to it. There's two reasons. <laughs> you're not in your room where you're supposed to be, where your charger is. I I was ha hooking up with a chick and went back to her place, or you're just completely hammered and you just don't put it in. But AJ McCarron would wake you up because he was a responsible human being as your roommate and would wake you up at seven a.m. Yeah. So I go with. And you got to love the way the Mannings handled it all too. I mean, they 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 yeah. took the high road on this whole thing. It's, oh yeah, it's all back on him. You know, it's there. I forgot who was who was I talk I was talking about with this. You know, you got to be glad that you got a, you're a great football player because you're not going to get some of the things you get on looks. I mean, oh, yeah. he's, he's not a good looking cat. I've got no room to talk in that whole subject. So if you're watching this on video, yeah. I don't know why. You know, but, but at least I know that that you know that's not one of the things I was afforded in life was you know a full head of hair and, and just dashingly good looks. Well, Manziel's cut from that same cloth, except yeah. he's got an arm of gold. Yeah. And so you know he's got some things that I don't there. So well, more power to him. You know, good luck, Scooby Doo. Yeah, that's exactly it. But uh, you know, anything else that we we didn't cover on media days that that you think we need to cover before we get into the team that you're excited about talking about? I I think Shane, the one of the things that I thought was um, really interesting, there was three things that I took away from a rules standpoint that I thought could be really impactful this this year. One, obviously, being the targeting, which we've heard some about over the last 60 days, um, which could lead to an automatic expense, uh, expo or ejection. The ejection from the game. Um, and that's that's going to be interesting because the, the understanding is um, that they've asked to really enforce this rule. Um, and, and they being the, the rules officials, yes. not, not the officials themselves. No, the official, the, the rules officials, yes, but it's not, been it's been handed to the officials to to lean on the side of protecting um, the defenseless, you know, the the defenseless person. So uh, what's, whether what's, it's what's uh, to me interesting about that is that the officials really don't want that in their hands. Heck no, they don't want it in their hands. And what's going to happen is, do you want to be the review official? Because basically what is going to be happening is when a target um, penalty is called, which is a 15-yarder automatic ejection, the review official can review the play to see if he can actually change the ejection, not the 15-yarder, but he deems that he maybe wasn't targeting um, to, to lead to an ejection. Um, so it can be changed after review. That's a very difficult deal, so I'm interested to see how this actually plays out. The, the other two that I thought were kind of hidden that nobody really talked a lot about, number one, the quarterback on a change of possession so, or the change of so, if you throw a, a throw run, a pick. It, you throw a pick, most likely there's or if there's a fumble. Um, the quarterback is automatically a defenseless player, so you can't just go and just blindside them like uh, Aaron Murray was hit in the SEC championship game. Um, now, do you think that was kind of, a? Do you think that was a direct result because of that play? No, I think I think it's just across the board. I think if they're going to do that, that they want because it. That's truly a targeting. It's been taught, you know, hey, whenever there's a change of possession, you go after the quarterback. And so you can block the quarterback, 
you can block him and do all that stuff, but you can't actually just blindside them um, where they're defenseless. So I thought that was interesting. And the other thing, Shane, that I think is going to be really interesting, um, and I hadn't got a lot of clarification on it, but essentially they're trying to um, get more of a standard of clock management at the end of the games. And I don't know if you saw this, but if you don't spike the ball, Three seconds? Least, yeah, with at least three seconds or more, it's just going to run out. There's no um, spiking it underneath, and they're basically saying that because there's so much of differences between time and clocking that if you don't have three seconds or more, then you don't have another play. And I was I was unsure of that. I, I heard that rule, too, and that one's muddy to me. Is it the ball has to be snapped before three seconds, or he has to throw the ball in, in a throwing motion to the ground at three seconds? That's a good question. Because I didn't get that. I mean, yeah. I, I heard I heard some interviews and stuff to – was it Shaw? Was he the director of officials? Is that I think I think the play has has to be dead before three before, seconds. Before three seconds, if it is under three seconds, it's just going to run two, one, bam, gone. Um, and so that's that's what I've heard. So I, I I thought those were big things to kind of take a look at, and make sure it's on a radar. I didn't know uh, if it was more like that or if it was like, you know, the shot clock. You, right. you know that if the ball goes out of bounds with X, per, X number of tenths of a second on the <laughs> ball that you can't even tip the ball in in right. basketball. I didn't know if it was a similar play to like that or if the ball actually – the the clock the, – and, and then if you're saying it has to be whistled dead, well, do they review to see if there's three seconds on the clock? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I, I, was, I had a lot of confusion when they were actually talking about it and – I think it are, I think there'll be a little bit more clarification, but it was something that I was just gonna, you know, it kind of just piqued my interest because I mean that's talking before halftime and at the end of games where, um, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of fans that don't know that, and yeah. so um, that's gonna be something to kind of watch to see when that first occurrence might happen. No, I'd heard all those rules, and, and the defenseless <clears throat> player it, to me, I think it was something that they'd kind of mulled over and were, were considering on the quarterback. But I do think that the Aaron Murray play at the end of the SEC uh, championship game helped um, bring that more to light and say, hey, this is something we need to really look at or implement. Yeah. Because you, you have some of those that I mean, the year before, I can't remember what the play was. Um, you, had a, you had a rules change last year because of it. The year before that was the Tennessee um, clock issue with, was it LSU? Yeah. That, that caused a rule change. So. You know, it, it can happen in a year because of a, one particular play that, that brings some things to light. And, and I think that Aaron Murray play um, had something to do with that. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that's it for our SEC Media Day coverage. Uh, we'll go right into the preview of Mississippi State Bulldogs. Blair, I know you're super excited about getting to talk about this one. You're going to be done for the rest of the the previews that we do now that we're talking about your team, but uh, you that's know, right. We're going twelve and zero. Twelve and zero. Okay. <laughs> now we know. What did I just say about those calling? No, I'm people? just kidding. I know. I know you are. <laughs> ten, ten, maybe eleven. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you tell me some things. I've got a couple. I, I'll do it more. You, you know Mississippi State backwards and forwards, so. You, you start talking, and I have a couple of questions written down here. If you don't hit them, I'll kind of bring them up and see what I think. See, Ask you your opinion on some of these. That sounds good. Um, well, I'll start off by... No, let me, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off. For, for for those that are just now keeping up with things, you know, Mississippi State last year went 8-5, 4-4 uh, and four in the SEC. Um, I think the big thing, though, was they started off 7-0 and 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 went one and five. That's how they, they had a split there, and there was a, def a definite night and day uh, on that program. And that that's the this, and that's the fourth year for Mullen going into his fifth year this year. Yeah. So it's all his program now. You know, yeah. there's no Sylvester Croom folks left over unless uh, I guess Tyler is with a fifth year. Uh, no, nah, he fifth. was a first class. Okay, he was actually a red shirt. So. He's part of uh, Mullen's first class. So, so there yeah. we go. It's it's done for. It's all his. So now I'm going to hand hand the mic back over. Sorry. Yeah, I mean it, it's one of the things that, and if you remember when we did podcast last year, 
Um, you know, I talk about, hey, you know, you got Jonathan Banks, you got Darius Slay, you've got these big time back end players on defense. And I really felt like this year we were going to have a better team um, than we were going to have last year. But the schedule set up last year for us to have a really good start if we took advantage of it. Um, this year, I think the schedule's way more difficult. So um, there's a couple of things that, to take into consideration last year. Um, you start out 7-0. and um, Tyler Russell is 19 touchdowns to one interception. Um, and then everybody goes, what happens? You know, well, I can tell you what happened in the first three weeks. It was called Alabama, LSU, and Texas A&M. So we lose three in a row and really never, never really kind of gained it back. We beat Arkansas. So if you tell me, Shane, last year, if we we're eight and three after 11 games and we lose to LSU, Alabama, and Texas A&M and we beat everybody else, I mean, that's exactly what we we're supposed to do. Um, the kicker was you go into the Egg Bowl um, after dominating for three years and make some mistakes in the first half um, where you have an opportunity to capitalize on Ole Miss's mistakes. You don't do it. It's a tie ball game. Next thing you know, they blow it wide open. And now all of a sudden you're on your heels at eight and four going into what I would consider a very tough bowl game against Northwestern. Um, and a pretty good little team that uh, we didn't we didn't prepare very well. So, um, but to kind of get away from 2012 into what they actually are today, um, offensively, the biggest thing that you're going to read about um, Shane and all of the well, a lot of the national broadcasters, well, we shouldn't even really suit up um, this year. We shouldn't even play football. Um, but, but the, uh, offensive side of the ball, the biggest glaring weakness that everybody points out is the wide receivers, um, that we have, uh, um, you know, our top four wide receivers are gone from last year. They're all seniors, you know, including Chad Bumpus, who, you know, really kind of came in his own his senior year and, and really had one of the more successful seasons in Mississippi state history. So, um, my counter to that is that um, I'm really excited about our wide receivers. Um, it's not like we're replacing them with a bunch of freshmen. Um, and she's photobombing, buddy. I know, and, uh, I saw that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, from the wide receiver standpoint, Shane, I mean, it's one of those things where um, we're going, we're transitioning from Mullen's first year of of guys that were 5'10 and that had spent four years in the program to now we've got guys that are 6'3, um, you know, 6'4, bigger receivers, more explosive. They just haven't played because they've been sitting behind guys with experience for this whole time. So it's not like we got guys that are coming in that are going to be true freshmen that have never played in a game. Um, you know, I really feel comfortable that um, that's negated a little bit by Tyler Russell and uh, him being a, a fifth-year senior um, to kind of help that from that standpoint. But there's there's a couple of things I look at on offense. The offensive line is pretty much back intact. Um, we got four out of the five starters um, from last year. The fifth starter, fifth person, really started five games last year. So um, we pretty much have everybody back from the offensive line standpoint. We are stacked at running back, and we got a fifth-year senior that – I think is going to bounce back from really the end of the season where we got exposed on the offensive line on the on the edge against really really high end elite defensive lines, um, and by doing that, Shane, I mean it just became apparent that Tyler Russell basically felt like he had to put the game in his hands and threw six interceptions in the last two games. Um, and he ended on a pretty sour note. So uh, um, I've watched the kid for six years, including in high school. Um, I have all the confidence in the world that he's going to bounce back and have, I think, a solid senior campaign because I think they all learned something from kind of getting their teeth mashed in the last five out of six games that, you know, one, la one loss ended up, compounding into a second loss and it just kind of steamrolled on them and they didn't know how to react to it after, you know, being ranked 12th in the nation and being seven and zero. Um, but the biggest key to me, Shane is 
not really offensively, it's defensively. Last year, we had um, Chris Wilson as our really our defensive coordinator. Um, he was a fantastic defensive line coach. He did not do well as a coordinator. Um, we had 18 sacks on the defensive line. We couldn't rush a soul. Um, the good thing was is that we had these great playmakers in the in the back end that helped make up a lot of stuff. Um, 30 turnovers, those types of things. But if you watched any of our games from Alabama and those last six games, people could run the football on us, and we couldn't dictate anything on defense, which really snowballed our offense because it required, you know, Tyler Russell to start trying to put things on his shoulders and doing a little bit more than he should have been doing. Um, and so – the thing that I actually see, we're going to lose a lot on the back end, but I think we're going to be way better up front, which hopefully negates a little bit of that. We're going to have a huge depth in the linebacker position. Um, and I feel a whole lot stronger from a defensive standpoint this year than I did last year. Um, you know, it's just one of those things where are you going to have 30 turnovers, um, you know, or um, – or is it going to be – I think you're going to see us be a little bit more chaotic on defense um, this year. And uh, so I feel comfortable about it. I don't think we're going to regress back to a four-win season. Um, you know, I think we're going to be right there at six, seven, eight wins to being kind of the top end there. I don't think we're going to be, hey, we're going to blow out and surprise people and win ten ball games. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we're going to fall apart and have three. Um, but uh, – I think we've got a lot of depth at, uh, across the board, and um, I'm really interested. Special teams is really, really good. Um, and uh, so that, that's kind of my synopsis. I think from a defensive standpoint, you lose a ton in the secondary from experience and four-year starters, but you were just so bad on the front end last year, you couldn't get to a quarterback. So we couldn't even really use them. Um, this year, I think from a defensive standpoint, we're going to be a little bit more chaotic on the front end. And I think you're going to see that sack number and pressure number go up, uh, which hopefully lets some of these guys in the back end, um, you know, kind of make up for that. Um, and I think offensively, I think we're going to be really, really well, do really, really good. Um, and, I'm, and I'm fired up about Tyler Russell. I think, I think Mullen and them did not do what they should have done and there's last part of the season with regards to schematically because it's more of, you know, Mullen does better with a running quarterback. I think we've seen that. I mean, my goodness, he took Chris Ralph and made him dangerous. Um, and so I think once you, once you get into future Dan Mullen in Mississippi State, it's going to be more of a dual threat, kind of getting back to that power run option game. Um, but Tyler Russell just throws the ball. He's not mobile. Well, aren't they going to put more into his hands this year as well as far as the play calling? Yeah, he's going to get uh, – he, he's kind of sat down with them and kind of told them, hey, this is what this is what I've done well and this is what I haven't done well. The other thing that people don't realize, Tyler Russell's been around forever, man. I mean, he's a fifth-year senior. But really last year was his first time being the guy. You know what I mean? He was the – you know, two years ago – Everybody wanted him to kind of take the take the reins, but Ralph was still there, and it was it ended up kind of being a little bit of a dual thing. And um, you know, last year it was Tyler Russell's team, um, you know, and he threw 24 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. I mean, you take a look at that as a first year starter, really, when it's in his hands at Mississippi State. That's records, dude. I mean, he's got. He's got a, he's in the record books in 11 categories in one season. Um, he, this year, he's going to destroy the record book. He's going to go down as the best quarterback in Mississippi State history. That tells you how terrible our quarterbacks are. He's going to do it in two years. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I mean, serious. I mean, he's he is he's that good and that efficient from a from a uh, offensive standpoint. Oh. So uh, I'm I'm excited about it, but. Um, you know, the problem with it, Shane, is is that we have, you know, you know, last year you catch an Auburn and you catch a Tennessee and you catch a Kentucky that are just offensively inept. Um, you know, Tennessee, they couldn't stop anybody, but they could throw the football on everybody. So we beat those teams. 
Uh, we beat those teams in four non-conference and started out seven and zero. Oh. Um, you know, and the the game that the game that you look back at, you go, okay, here's the egg ball. That's the game you lost. That's the one that got out that you say, hey, I should have had a, I, sh I should have, I didn't take care of mistakes that steamrolled on us, and they took three years of beatings and just rubbed it in your nose. Um, and this is the first year that they've gone into the off season with a bowl loss. Um, you know, so um, it's inherent. I mean, it's a it's a different deal when you've got three three years of players that have been to two New Year's Day bowls and a Music City Bowl in three consecutive years. So um, I think there's a little bit of a hunger there to say, hey, if we run into this three game stretch, which they do have. Um, could you call at South Carolina, at Texas A&M, and Alabama at home a pretty tough three 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 game stretch? Um, you know, coming up just like last year, um, you got to be able to bounce back and handle it. And I, I think that was their mantra of SEC media days that one turned into a snowball and and it got ugly real quick. Um, so we'll see how it turns out. But I think from a football standpoint, Shane, I think they're a better team this year. Um, I think projection-wise than they were last year. Um, I just think their schedule is going to be difficult. I don't think there's a. I think it's if you win, if they go eight wins this year, that's a freaking monumental freaking season to me. That's just me though. All right, looking at my questions, Blair, you, you answered all of them but one. All right, we, and and. Almost to the T. I mean, one of them was, was so much to, is Tyler Russell going to bounce back after throwing six picks in two games at the bowl game loss? <laughs> you basically said that whole question for me, which, which is so funny. Um, but let's talk about the running back. Uh, Perkins yeah. last year, he rushed over 1,000 yards. Yeah. Um, you know, this year I think he's got a little help. Uh, wh what's it going to look like having that multi-back scenario? Do you think that's going to be successful? Do you think they're going to really implement that and give him – some rest, so he's going to be a little fresher uh, well, as we get to the end of the season? I think there's a couple of things, Shane, that come into play here. And I think when we got into the tough part of the schedule, it really it really developed on offense. One was, first of all, when we got into the elite teams, the Alabamas, the LSUs, the Texas A&Ms, our defense couldn't keep them off the field, Okay. Um, we couldn't get off the field and get our offense back on. So when our offense went out there in those big games and those in that three game stretch, we we averaged like 55 yards. Like Perkins averaged like 55 yards rushing a game, um, and we didn't run the ball well. Um, a little bit of that is we had you know we have um, you got Josh Robinson, Derek Milton, and you also have Nick Griffin who's got a second knee injury, um, which is unfortunate, uh, that just happened to him. All three of those guys are solid. You know, Robinson and Milton really got their feet wet last year, so we should see a lot of bit. The biggest thing about Perkins is, is his, his ability to catch the ball. Um, you know, he was the fourth leading receiver last year, um, you know, for the team. Um, you know, so that's where it's going to be. Can we – you know, just grind out and run the football against the elite teams. Um, so, and that's where that's where it got a little bit. And I think that's the schematic that I was talking about. So could you say that part of your issue last year is when you needed to move the change to give your defense a break, you just couldn't do it? No. We couldn't do it, not against the elite teams. We could do it on the other ones. Um, and, and a little bit of that is, um, you know, because the first thing people look at is they go, dang, man, they got four receivers that that were 2,000 yards of production. That they're gone. And But if you if you take Chad Bumpus out of it, um, who was a 5'9 explosive receiver, you had Chris Smith and Arcito Clark, who made, basically made up the difference. Those two guys are 5'10, and they averaged about eight yards a catch. Because guess what? Tyler Russell threw it eight yards, and they caught it, and that's all they did. Um, they, you never saw Arcito Clark catch the ball, break a tackle, turn a nine-yard pass into a 21-yard gain. That's what is being ex kind of exposed in spring ball and some of that stuff is that we have bigger receivers 
we have the potential to be more explosive. Kids that can break tackles and do some of those things where Tyler Russell doesn't have to go 12 plays down the field to sustain a drive. He can actually have an explosive play that gets him 23 yards. If you watched the Mississippi State game last year or the last two years, did you see many plays over 20 yards? You didn't. Um, you know, there wasn't these big explosive plays outside of Chad Bumpus. Um, and I think that's where you're going to get at. And I think what happened a lot last year was that the scheme, it made it so predictable against some of the elite teams that we just couldn't run the football. Um, and against those elite teams, we, we got a lot of our, – our tackles got exposed. Um, and – and you know, like anything, when you're on the offensive line, there's nothing like experience and being in the line of fire of any other position in football. Um, you just can't, you can't teach, you know, going up against a, a Mingo and a studs, a LSU throws at you or Alabama throws at you. So um, you think they're going to be better for that. But, um, you know, but I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, Perkins – uh, you know, that kid is, um, you know, he was second in all-purpose yards, I think, last year at the SEC. Um, so I think he's he's not going to need to carry the ball as many times. I think we'll have some other stuff, and I think he'll be more explosive. Um, but that's the big key. I'm, I'm really interested to see how we actually do offensively, but I think the big key to it is defensively. If you know Mississippi State football, we're going to make you grind for everything you did, and last year we didn't make you grind for everything you had to grind for. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I get you. Um, all right, so let's kind of look at the schedule as we, we get to the back end of this podcast. Um, you think that eight games is going to be a really good season, so let's see where those four losses lie. Uh, you're going to start the season off, and, and and we talked on the other podcast about Florida, and most of the teams this this SEC season are starting off with playing some pretty decent talent, and Florida was a, was one of the exceptions. They I think was a Toledo, yeah, is who they had, um, you know. But Mississippi State starts off. Uh, is this a, is this in, it's in Texas? Is it not at yeah. Oklahoma State? No, yeah, it's um, a Reliant State. Okay, down in Houston. Yeah. It's called the Texas Kickoff or something classic. Um, but yeah. you know that's that's a good program to to, to start your season oh. off. Yeah, Vegas thinks so. We're a fourteen and a half point underdog. There you go. So now is Oklahoma State supposed to be that good this year? Or well, you know they dropped back to an eight. You know they were eight and five last year, and they changed their offensive coordinator, the defense coordinator, but they were just picked um, to win the the. Big 12, that's a Big 10 or whatever they are now. Um, but, Big 12 with 10 teams? Yeah, yeah, but um, they're supposed to be explosive, man. So, I'm, I mean, you know, last year they couldn't they could stop anybody, you know. So they were putting, you know, 40 points on the board. They're giving up 45. And so, um, you know, so I'm interested. That really is a very intriguing game for me because I think um, – I'll be interested to see how we play and how we perform and how we come out and if we're ready. Um, it's going to test our secondary. I mean, I mean, Mullen said at SEC Media Days that we're going to walk in there with an inexperienced secondary and we're going to walk out with an experienced secondary. <laughs> so, because they're going to throw the football, you know. Um, and so, you know, the way I look at the schedule, Shane, there's a there's a couple of things. It's going to be the way this SEC thing works up we're always going to be heavy on the back end of the schedule, um, just the way things line up. If you look at November, you got at South Carolina, at Texas A&M, Alabama at home, at Arkansas, Ole Miss at home. So you're looking right there. You're, you got a South Carolina team, a Texas A&M team that you're going back-to-back to two far ends of yeah, you can't the get places. First, you can't yeah. get any further um, from the SEC – it's hard, and then, it's hard geographically. And then you come home and get to play Alabama at home. And then you get to go to Arkansas, which you've never won in Arkansas. You've played there 14 times in Little Rock or in Fayetteville, and you've lost every time. All right, never so won one. Let's, let's go back to Oklahoma State. Do you think you can pull that one out? Do you think you can make up those 14 points? That's a... 
<sighs> I think that's one we've got to win. I know you got to win. You got to and, and, and doing are two different things. I'm going to say that we're not going to win that ball game. All right, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to give you the, the next couple are easy ones. Alcorn State. Alcorn, I think we got that one. Auburn. At Auburn, I think that's the one we got to win. And I think right now, I think we're a better football team than Auburn. I think so, too. Um, and, I think, and I think if you're ever going to catch Auburn this year, you better catch them early because I think by the end, Miles On's going to have them going a little bit more efficiently from an offensive standpoint, but they just still – they don't know who their quarterback's going to be. Um, and that's still a big deal. And I think by week three, um, that's been kind of a measuring stick for us. We finally got over that hump last year. Um, I think we got to win that one. I think you um, do too. I think you got to start off – yeah. Troy's at home. Um, I think that's a W. Um, LSU, that's the first game I'm going to. I think LSU's going to struggle. We've lost 23 of 24, 19 in a row. I was there the last time we won a game against LSU. It was a long freaking time ago. Um, you know, is that a team that we can that we can beat? I think we can beat them. We've been right there on the cusp of it. But I still think we're not. Until we beat them, I'm never going to predict this beating LSU, I swear to God. All right, so you've got two losses, three wins. Yeah. And then you're going to have Bowling Green and yeah. Kentucky. I think you're giving yourself wins on both of those. Yeah. I think so. I mean, on the, the Bowling Green, you got – that's a tough game now. Bowling Green's a good ball club. They're very, very good non-conference. Kentucky's Nobody's a good ball club, but you're still going to uh, give the you're you're giving Mississippi yeah. State the win on both. And Kentucky's and that's on Thursday night, so it's going to be a little bit of unique um, standpoint. So um, I, I think we're losing South Carolina. I'm just hoping Tyler Russell doesn't get hurt. Um, I think we're losing at Texas A&M. And how many losses have I got so far? That's four. So you're going to say you're going to. You're not going to say you're going to beat Alabama. I'm saying if we win eight ball games, we are ridiculous. I still think we're going to be more six and six, seven and five as kind of the high end. Um, I, and I and I'll and I'll break it down this way, Shane. I think South Carolina, Texas A&M, Alabama, sure losses. I think we're losing all three of those. I think your toss Oklahoma, up games I think your toss. I think Oklahoma State, Auburn, LSU, and Arkansas make the year one way or the other one way or the other and I think the Ole Miss game there is absolutely no telling everybody at Ole Miss is basically going to say they're going to come in and with us and I think we bounce back I think home I think home field advantage and that thing helps it's going to be on Thursday night Thanksgiving night I'm giving myself a win there I I'll give you. I, I'll agree with that. Um, you know, I don't want to give you the Kentucky win, but and I don't. Want to, it, Kentucky to me is a little bit like Auburn. You just don't know what you're going to get this year. Right. Um, and even if I get a much improved Kentucky program, I'm I'm just hoping for a bowl game again. Um, you know, I can I don't think we can go straight to where Vanderbilt is today and get to that eight eight win level plateau and and, and actually think that you have a chance to get some of the upper upper programs in the SEC this year. Um, we still have too much to prove. So you're right with the Kentucky game. I think you couldn't have had said it any better about Auburn. Um, Auburn is a team you do want to catch early because you're right, Gus Melzahn is, is, a, is a magic worker. And that program last year I think was better than their record showed, and I talked about that last week. I think they're a better program than their record showed. It's just they just didn't want to play. Right. You know, kind of oh yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, I think quarterback is a big uh, is a big part of that, and Miles ought to get that fixed. Yeah, and, and that's where they're they're struggling. Just like we talked about Florida this year, you know, they know who their quarterback is. Well, Auburn still doesn't know who their quarterback is. They, right. They they've got some issues to work out there. So you're right. I I, I don't think there's any way that you can get South Carolina, Texas A&M, and Alabama. You're right there. Arkansas. Um, you know, what do you have with Bellini in that program yeah. there? That can, that's another program that can go either way. 
But I'm going to give you the Ole Miss one. I think you all were embarrassed last year um, at that Egg Bowl. I think that you have something to prove. And if you look at it on paper, you guys are just as talented as that as Ole Miss, if not more so. And so because of that, because it's at home, because you don't want that second loss in a row to Ole Miss, I'm going to give you guys that win as well. So. Yeah, I mean the the kicker is Shane is that you got you get LSU and Alabama at home, and you get Auburn, Arkansas on the road. You know Auburn and Arkansas, you go well they're they're supposed to be down this year, but you get them at their places. Yeah, so that that's, so you know that's a tough deal. And then you know so now and then you lose Tennessee and you pick up at South Carolina. You know so now you're just like. You know, and then you go, oh, yeah, we're just going to throw out on one of our non-conference, and we're just going to go to Reliant Stadium and play Oklahoma State to yeah. open up the year. So, I mean, you know, I, I think if they go 6-6, six and six, I think it's just as good as going 8-4 and four last year with that schedule um, because you lost one game that you probably shouldn't have lost, which was the Ole Miss game um, this year. I mean, you know, but if you all of a sudden start out and you win Oklahoma State, now you go, okay, now I got a little bit deal because now I can go down to the Plains and play Auburn. If I win that ball game, I got a chance to be 4-0 and with LSU coming to the house. And we don't really know what LSU is going to be yeah. uh, yeah. with eight guys going out. And so, um, and that's why you know, we talk about college football is because you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it could all of the – you could talk a dozen different scenarios that could happen, and we just don't know which one's going to come true other than Alabama – it's going to be great. All I do know is that on the 24th of October, we need to either have us a big cookout or something. This Thursday night, we need to be watching the game. So we need to be taking off the 25th is what you're really saying. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we need to see what we can make happen for that uh, as well. That might be two Kentucky games we catch this year for me. All right. Any we I, we did not do this on the first podcast, and we always do when our we do an open mic. Is there anything on the open mic you'd like to to share on this podcast? Yes. If you're 37 years old, um, and you're dealing with a couple of four year old boys and trying to teach them to slip and slide, be careful because I think I cracked some ribs doing my uh, face first Pete Rose slide imitation for them and caught a little hard spot in the grass and just about killed me. So, other than that, it was good. So you're not 12 anymore is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah it showed me real quick, man. Well, people can follow you on Twitter, though, correct? Yes, they can follow me at Blair Smiley, S-M-Y-L-Y. -Y. All right. I'll, for my open mic, and then we'll close this thing down, it's, it's fish tacos. Uh, <laughs> Never, never been. A, I, I never thought I would be a big fan, but you know, wife turned me on to those I don't know, six months or so ago. I really like fish tacos. Really? Uh, yeah, they're they're good. You know, when, when you, but when you look at it in its essence, what it is, it's tortilla chips or tor corn tortillas wrapped around fried fish with a little coleslaw, a little hot sauce or something a little to add a little kick. I mean, what's not lo not to love there? So. So I hate coleslaw and the cabbage stuff. Now that. you can get it without the cabbage, but you know I'm, uh -huh. I'm a fan of cabbage, so uh, you know it just it was it's good. I'm a, I'm a I'm a big fan of fish tacos. Had those for dinner tonight. It's like you know I never thought I would really like fish tacos and just say I want to go to a restaurant to eat fish tacos. So let's yeah. go to a restaurant solely on the purpose to eat a fish taco. But I could do that, and so that's where I am. <laughs> Guys, my my Twitter is p shane bailey. Uh, I'll talk a little sports, talk a little HR, talk a little social media, a little digital um, technology as well. So if you want to follow any of those things, uh, even talk a little wine. Uh, with the, the Nashville Wine Auction was this past weekend. So I uh, did a little, little wine talking, went to a great wine tasting. Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, descendants of Tattinger, the champagne company, and their Tattinger Champagne. Yeah. Uh, he spoke at the, the wine tasting we went to, um, you know, talk, talking all about their champagne and their history. And uh, Martin Senor, one of the just pillars of the wine distributors, um, you know, she's just responsible for help bringing Burgundies 
uh, over to America back in the 70s and 80s, um, and really bringing that popularity there. And so, you know, both of them were there, got to taste some of the stuff that they're responsible for. Um, and uh, it was just a really, really good time. Had some really great wines. So even throw those things out on Twitter as well. But guys, with that, we're going to call this podcast done. <laughs>